Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar presentation. Um, we are going to be having one of our licensed clinicians, Benjamin Monk, doing a presentation on attachment theory today as part of our April webinar series, Blossom and Bloom. Uh, a little bit about Ben. Ben serves as one of our newer clinicians at the NJ4S Hub. Ben received his Bachelor of Science in Social Work from Stockton University and a Master of Social Work from Rutgers in Camden, New Jersey. Previously, he has worked within a residential outpatient and inpatient setting where he has provided individual counseling services related to the mental health and substance use challenges faced by today's youth. Ben has also worked in high school settings providing mental health services to adolescents with behavioral changes. As a result, he has a passion for working with the adolescent population and their families to help support them towards their individualized goals for future success. Without further ado, I turn it over to Ben. Thanks, Whitney. Um, so I guess I'll just start off, guys. Um, so today I'm here to speak to you all about attachment theory and the keys to building secure bonds with your children. I'm a part of Prevention Links and NJ4S Union Hub, and let's get started. So a little introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Ben Monk. I'm a social worker, and like Whitney said, I graduated from Rutgers University School of Social Work, Camden 2023. And a reason why I think attachment theory is really important is because it kind of helps us understand how we came to be who we are now through understanding how our parents responded to us and how that influenced our social and behavioral outcomes. We'll even talk a little bit about the neurological development um, further on too. So let's get started. Um, today's agenda. We're going to do an overview of attachment theory. We're going to talk about the four attachment styles, some of the outcomes behaviorally, socially, and some parenting behavior that can lead to these types of attachment styles. Afterwards, we'll get into brain growth and how attachment impacts the brain. And then lastly, we'll get into some verbal and nonverbal skills for creating more secure and strong bonds with your family members. Lastly, we'll get into a little conclusion and recap and just kind of sew everything together that we learned today. But let's get into it. So first, our overview. So I wanted to kind of start with a quote by John Bowlby, who is like the originating um, theorist of attachment theory. So it says, the propensity to make strong emotional bonds is a particular to particular individuals is a basic component of human nature. And I kind of thought this was an important quote that kind of opens up what attachment theory is because that bond that we form with our parents is like the most important thing to a child when they're born. And I kind of like that paired with this picture that we have here. We see the parent in the background, the child exploring out, and it's our hope that this attachment figure can kind of provide that protection, comfort, and emotional regulation that this child needs to explore the world and feel secure. So let's kind of get into a little bit more of that. So humans, and especially infants, rely on attachment figures for, like I said, protection, comfort, and emotional regulation. Um, attachment theory states that uh, babies who are born um, do this as an evolutionary instinct to help form bonds with their caregivers. Um, typically, this is, could be the mother, the father, the step-parent, an adoptive parent, or a sibling. And what this bond does is it creates the security and safety, and conceptually this is called the safe haven and secure base. So what this does essentially is it provides a layer of security that a child needs in order to venture out into the world and feel like when there is a level of threat or some um, 
scary feelings out there when they're apart from their family. They have somewhere to return to to help emotionally regulate their feelings. So let's kind of look at what that looks like. I have a picture that's coming up that kind of sews that all together. And so I kind of like this. Um, I found this the other day and I found it probably the most helpful in kind of explaining what a secure base is. You can kind of see on the left these two hands that are outreaching. One that says at the top a secure base and one that says safe haven. So we can kind of see how this child up top is leaving the comfort of the family to go explore, to, um, you know, there's another boy climbing this tree. And it's that accessibility and responsiveness that allows a child to venture out. And this engagement is really crucial for children's development. So when we see fear and uncertainty activate, you can see how this child, this young girl is running back, this young boy is crying. They wish to be welcomed, to protect it, to comfort and help organize their feelings. And I think this is probably the most compelling part of attachment theory is how we are responsive to our child's needs. Um, and something that's interesting about this is if there is no engagement from the parent's part, the message that the child receives is that your signals for comfort do not matter to me. And then in part, how does the child interpret that lacking responsiveness, that lacking connection? So we'll kind of see that and we'll kind of look at what impacts have depending on the parent-child bond. So some things that are impacted include their emotional regulation, brain development, some long-term mental health, and even stress tolerance. Um, and attachment figures, as we've already spoken about, um, begin to develop these self-views based on the responsiveness, um, sensitivity to their needs that help determine how they view their worth to themselves and others. And so what these are called are attachment styles. So let's kind of see what the attachment styles are defined as. And so there are four attachment styles. We'll start off by talking a little bit about secure attachment. And so secure attachment are typically seen as children or adults that have high self-esteem, seek social support with ease, and have ease sharing of their feelings with others. Next, we can talk about insecure attachments. And so that includes anxious attachment, avoidant attachment, and even disorganized attachment. So briefly, anxious attachment are people or children that have a strong desire for reassurance um, and discomfort with too much independence, which can lead to low self-worth. Avoidant attached people may struggle with intimacy, relationships, and a willingness to share their feelings. And lastly, disorganized attachment comes from a presentation that may appear both avoidant and anxious with this almost dichotomous um, view of wanting a connection with someone but being afraid of the vulnerability that's required to maintain a relationship. And so we see these in various types and presentations, but let's get into a little deeper about what it means to be securely attached and what parenting style we can um, look to utilize to create more securely attached children. So, secure attachment. Um, Securely attached people typically display a confidence and trust in oneself. They believe in their abilities to show up. They embrace emotional closeness and express themselves with a lack of fear of rejection. Um, that may come from a place that in the past, their caregiver was quite sensitive and responsive to how they were reacting in the moment to 
a certain stimulus that created an upset reaction. And based on that parent's reaction, the responsiveness, it showed to the child that you're important, your feelings matter, which creates this healthy emotional regulation and an appropriate expression and management of the child's emotion. And it's very like allows a person to grow and become this autonomous, curious person because they feel safe in the world, knowing that a care provider can provide some regulation if that insecurity pops up. And so briefly, some uh, parenting behaviors that can kind of help create these stronger bonds with children could be, you know, responsive caregiving, you know, responding to the cues, to the sensitivity, and in a timely manner that provides comfort, reassurance, uh, emotional availability, and providing warmth and affection and empathy provides like a space for children to feel seen and heard. And one of the most important is um, consistency and predictability. Does that parent consistently show up for a child when they are in distress so the child knows adaptively that this person is here for them, that these behaviors that the parent displays are consistent enough that the child knows that what is important to them in that moment is important to the parent, creating that foundational relationship that will um, help a child kind of be who they need to be for the future. Okay, so let's get on to insecure attachment. So I kind of like this meme on the right because it kind of is a very accurate description of um, the anxiety that kind of brews inside of a person's head if they are anxiously attached. There's this constant need for reassurance or validation from the thoughts that come from an inconsistent caregiving. So people with anxious attachment typically um, struggle with fear of abandonment or rejection in relationship, typically because of how a caregiver responded inadequately to their child's needs and how that left them feeling anxious about their own feelings. There is a level of heightened sensitivity um, to disapproval and criticism. And this, you know, creates this feeling later on in life that what they're capable of may or may not be enough for the situation at hand. And also there's some difficulty in trusting the reliability of the caregivers. Um, this can come from overly intrusive or overly protective behaviors from a parent that intrudes on a child's autonomy when they were growing up, which signals to a child that there might be uh, danger or you should be concerned about your capabilities, which impacts how a child views themselves. And so just briefly, I think um, what's most important with anxious attachment parenting behavior is the fostering of almost too much dependence on the parent that the parent fosters creates this uncertainty and lack of emotional security that can lead to this heightened anxiety and fear of um, rejection in relationships that spans like the lifetime of the child so yeah i think that's quite important but let's move on to avoidant attachment which <laughs> is probably my favorite just because of this meme that i found that is um quite accurate in the uh, presentation of avoidant so people with avoidant attachment typically have um, difficulty with emotional closeness and intimacy in relationships this typically comes from a lack of responsiveness from the caregiver and an inconsistency to value the child's emotions and physical needs. And so there is this rejection and this difficulty to express their emotions appropriately, um, which has this tendency to 
downplay relationships later on because of this dismissal early on of a child's emotional expression. And so this kind of helps us understand how this fear of dependence and vulnerability comes to be, which leads to emotional distancing. Um, and ultimately, you know, the emphasis of avoidant attachment is a emphasis on independence without need for a secure base for exploration, excuse me, <laughs> early on. And lastly, let's move on to disorganized attachment. Um, Briefly, I think I'm gonna go over the parenting behavior that can lead to disorganized attachment. So disorganized attachment has this kind of stigmatizing view because of you know, the caregivers um, early on displayed these kind of frightening or scary, confused, unpredictable behaviors for the child. And this largely comes from a history of neglect or trauma that kind of disrupts the creation of a really cohesive attachment strategy, which leads to these kind of inconsistent and erratic behaviors in relationships. Um, there can be confusion and ambivalence in response to caregivers. And this may come from the past of a caregiver displaying these boundary violations, blurring the lines between caregiver and child roles, where maybe a parent requires the child almost to um, meet their emotional needs, which signals to a child this role reversal. I'm the one who takes care of you and not vice versa, which is how securely attached children form. And it's, so this inconsistency kind of creates this hostile behavior or because of the lacking of nurturance in them. And so to kind of sew this all up, I have a video that I'd like to show you guys to kind of help um, put this together. It's a pretty short video, so it's only like three minutes, I think. So let's see, learn from this. This experiment, which I watched through a two-way mirror, is designed to gauge how secure is the crucial relationship between mother and child. This one is moved over here, and that one is The value of the test has been established in studies that would watch a child one year old and then follow it up and interview them about their relationships to their parents when they were 21 years old. So we're quite confident in the long-term significance of this relationship. After several minutes play, the mother is signaled to leave the room. The key moment in the experiment is the child's reaction to her mother's return. The important clue is whether the baby's able to become calmed down by the contact with the mother and back to play. Sometimes it takes a couple of minutes. You see, when the mother was out, she was only interested in the mother. No interest in the toys. Now she has a contact with her mother. She's beginning to show a little interest in the environment. And shortly she'll be right back with the toys when we start. So you would call this a secure one? Yes. She's certainly much happier. Most of the dwarf following her. Now we, we sent the mother right back in, but the point here is not to distress the baby. We're just trying to challenge it. The baby puts her hands to her face. A sad expression, her face down. When she picks her up, she keeps her head down, her arms out, and then she sits in the chair holding the baby. The baby's still sullen. 
He's low keyed. So you would call the this insecure? Yes, attachment. insecure. He's avoidant. He's he's not engaging her, and it's not the reunion is not effective. And it's important to remember here that the thing that upset him was her absence. Her re, her return should be the solution to his problem. Now this is another pattern that we see in babies who are not good at using their mother as a secure base at home. This baby is also insecure. But you'll see, we get a look at his play before the separation. The mother's left. And when she returns, she picks him up. He can't calm down. He's still upset. She offers a toy to amuse him or to comfort him or to distract him, and he slaps it away. She offers another. He slaps it away. He's angry. He's, he's, we call these babies resistant or ambivalent because they both want her back and yet can't use the contact. We think that the difficulty is that in the past, when he sought comfort, she's been inconsistent as to whether she's available and responsive or not. Okay. Um... I just wanted to take a quick second to kind of engage you guys and just quickly, um, what did you guys notice about the video? Like, what st stood out? I think I'll start. Um, something that I noticed that was really um, illustrative of ambivalent or disorganized attachment is how the child reacts to the caregiver. I, I think something that's interesting about this uh, experiment that was done is how children react to the removal and the reintroduction of the caregiver. And something that really stuck out about that last one was how the reintroduction still couldn't calm the the child's reaction to whatever stimulus was causing distress. And so we kind of see that um, further along the timeline with a child's development is that if there is this kind of um, negative response, it kind of continues down their life. But uh, if no one has anything else, I will uh, continue on. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about brain growth and how attachment influences it. So I know we just did a video, but I feel like it might be best to have a brief overview of what it is that the brain does and how it is um, influenced by these various developmental factors. And then we'll talk briefly about how attachment plays into them. All right, guys, um, quick video on the development of the brain, how it grows, and how we learn throughout our lives. Just quickly a brief overview of, like, the structures of the brain. All right, let's watch. 86 billion nerve cells, 100 trillion connections, 7.6 billion manifestations, zillions of things that could go wrong. Isn't it surprising that in the majority of cases, our brains turn out just fine? Let's take a look at the processes that allow this complex organ to grow and function smoothly. Brain development, and therefore learning, begins in the womb. By the time a child is born, the major brain structures are already in place. But brain development doesn't stop at birth. The best is yet to come. As we grow up, we first learn basic and then increasingly complex skills. This is possible because the different regions of our brains mature and become more and more specialized. And while we learn, brain connections are constantly being formed and modified. Many factors influence this process. In the beginning, our genes play the most important role for assembling the structures in the brain. But as the brain's development continues, our environments and the stimuli they provide become more important. Eventually, our genetic makeup and environment work in tandem to determine how the brain performs. During the first three to four years of life, perceptual and sensory systems in the brain become specialized and lay the foundation for functions such as language, social behavior, and emotion. Everything that goes right or wrong during these stages of development has consequences. 
But because brains are resilient, not every harmful factor will lead to dysfunction, nor does the brain need only positive experiences to function properly. Whether early adversities disrupt brain development depends on our personal dispositions just as much as on our environments. Brain development reaches a major milestone between the ages of 22 to 25. By then, most areas have fully matured. But after that, our brains are far from static. They continue to learn and change throughout our lives. The rate of change may vary, but the process never ends. The human brain, a spongy mass of tissue that consists mostly of water, is indeed the most complex object in the universe. Okay, so I hope that kind of helps share and helps us understand the basics of the brain. You know, there's a lot of connections that occur within the brain that um, are heavily influenced by, oh, sorry. So we can see how there's various influences on the brain's growth, whether that be genetics, the environment, nutrition, or childhood experiences. You know, genetics are the basic blueprint that kind of help determine who we are. And the environment kind of influences genetics by um, creating either a supportive environment uh, or it can kind of hinder development. And those kind of two work in tandem. But we're here mostly to talk about the childhood experiences and how those uh, shape our brain functions. So let's move on to see how they do that. So parenting styles influence brain development through the creation and reinforcement of neural connections. So there's various components of the brain. A neuron is like the basic component and they come together to create these connections in the brain. And when parenting skills or messages are interpreted via the child through the parent, they become reinforced. So I'll kind of give this example. Um, an anxious, anxiously attached child may interpret the message that the world is unsafe and therefore grow to become more anxious. The part of the brain that is associated with stress, anxiety, and um, dependency on others may be reinforced over time, which creates the behavior and the uh, mental health that is um, pivoted more anxiously. So depending on that caregiver attachment, we can see how certain behaviors, emotions, kind of outcome from parenting um, attachment. But you may be asking, like, specifically, what parts of the brain are impacted? So let's have a look at a couple of them, okay? So we have the brainstem, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the prefrontal cortex. So, so some basics about this is that the brainstem is largely dealing with unconscious motions of our daily life, like heart rate, stress response, and breathing. And so previously, like how I discussed how someone who is anxiously attached may have um, determinants of anxiety or dependence, we may see those neural connections in the brainstem being reinforced to create these patterns of anxiety, this heart rate, this breathing that um, shows through that parental attachment an anxious um, person. Um, we have the hippocampus, which is involved in memory formation and learning. So the experiences that we have with our parent or our caregiver heavily influence how we choose to navigate this world. If you are someone who is avoidantly attached, then maybe your parenting upbringing was of a parent who didn't really um, help you regulate your emotions, you may be less inclined to um, express those emotions willingly. So those memories might form this um, reinforcement that it's not safe to share your emotions. And so we look at the amygdala, which also plays a role in that. There's that fear response 
Um, in a disorganized person, we may see a fear of um, attachment. We might see a fear of emotional closeness. And we can see how kind of, um, through the reinforcement of behaviors from the parenting, that um, closeness, that proximity, or lack of impacts the outcome of a child. And lastly, we have the prefrontal cortex, which it largely deals with decision making, impulse control, and emotional regulation. In a securely attached child, we might see more positive connections associated with these positive decision making, impulse control, and capability of sharing, feeling, and sitting with their emotions. So, in conclusion, there are many, many intersections that influence brain development. But I think it's really important to um, keep attachment in the conversation because these early, early formative um, relationships that we have with our caregiver can still influence how we show up in the world later on. So I think it's important to kind of now get into like some verbal, nonverbal skills. Like what can we do to create or recreate better, stronger bonds with our kids or even your family members? So let's kind of look at that. Um, yeah, verbal, nonverbal skills. So let's talk about verbal communication first. And so we'll kind of get into this. So what is verbal communication? Um, some verbal communication skills that can, you can use with your kids could include open-ended questions. Um, we kind of gauge and ex help children empower themselves through building confidence in our bid to help them feel heard and valued, you know? As a clinician, you know, it's, it's part of our duty to kind of help children process what it is that they're going through or what they've been through. And, um, you know, rather than a parent continually saying, how was your day, which can be, you know, simply um, from a child's perspective, the response could just be good, it was fine. But you know, some questions that we can consider asking in those moments, more open-ended could be possibly, uh, what was the best part of your day? An invitation for a child to express themselves outside of um, these one-worded yes or no, bad or good dichotomies. And I, I think that's really important and something to explore in terms of building stronger bonds with children. Um, affirmations, offering praise for your child's efforts. Um, even the small things I think is really important because, you know, developmentally, the things that children go through can be challenging. And, you know, to build that uh, safe haven, offering praise, showing that their efforts are valued is incredibly important so that children feel safe and heard and, you know, willing to come back to you because they, they see that you are of someone who praises their efforts, not perfection, but just trying their best. Um, active listening, incredibly important, kind of reflecting back what you hear can kind of help a child um, understand that you value their, uh, what they have to say, you know, is there a different way that you can display that and acknowledge and validate what your child is saying reflectively rather than jumping to a, um, a sense of, you know, correction, you know, I, I think as I grew up, I, I always had this tendency to um, jump in to help rather than listen. And sometimes what children value most is just being heard. So reflecting back what you hear in the context of your child's communication with you can illustrate to them that you hear them, you see them. and. Um, it's just acknowledging that what they have to say is important. 
Um, using clear and direct language is helpful in establishing boundaries. You know, creating this very emphatic yes or no in response to some of the behaviors that we see in the family unit um, that fosters this firm but limiting boundary that kids are allowed to do certain things but there are certain things that kids aren't allowed to do and it's through that creation of boundary and clear language that kind of helps children see how to navigate the world. Um, so let, let's move on to um, nonverbal communication and talk a little bit about that. So some things that are really important to consider in nonverbal communication with your children could include body language, facial expression, eye contact, tone of voice, and timing and pacing. So in terms of body language, I think posture is something to really consider because it can communicate a lot. You know, if you're slouched over, you know, what does this really send the message to? It shows that maybe you're not receptive, maybe you're not open, but by having your posture be straight up, kind of could convey a message of attentiveness. And similarly, like if you were to cross your arms, that may come off as defensive. So these are things to be mindful of when communicating with our kids because their message is that while may not be overt, there is still a level of association that kids um, see in our body language and what that means to them. So moving on, we also have facial expressions and you know, the face can display a wide range of emotions. So being aware of matching the emotion to the message that you're sending can really change the impact of what we're saying. You know, growing up, I know I've, <laughs> I've heard of plenty of story of the, the, resting, the resting face and um, you know, we just want to be aware of what we look like. Because if your face is sullen and bored, but your, your, your message is kind, sometimes children see your face first before they hear the message. And so it's important to kind of recognize, take a moment and reflect on how the message is coming across, how it is viewed. And so similarly, uh, attending to eye contact and even tone of voice can convey a lot. So paying attention to the appropriateness shows that you're paying attention and that what they have to say matters. Similarly, um, knowing when to speak and when to listen shows children that what they have to say matters. And it's like essential for communication with these youths. You know, again, jumping to a, um, a want to help and provide a solution for children isn't always what children want. Having them speak and talk out their problems and kind of reflect back to them in a manner that makes sense helps them explore the problems on their own and shows that you're willing to sit in a tune with those feelings. And so I kind of wanted to get into this video. It's from the movie um, Inside Out. And I thought it really kind of helps illustrate ways in which we can kind of act on what we know now about verbal and non-communication. Um, so let's kind of take a look at that. And then afterwards, we can quickly just um, see what we noticed, OK? All right. Look at this. 
No, I, 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 I. Oh, here's a fun game. You point to the train station and we all go there. Won't that be fun? Come on, let's go to the train station. I'm sorry they took you like it. They took something that you loved. It's gone. Sadness. Don't make him feel worse. Mm. It's all I had left the bride. I don't know why I had all the adventures. Oh, they were wonderful. Once we flew back to Charlie, we had breakfast twice that day. Sadness. It sounds amazing. I bet Riley likes it. Oh, she did. We were best friends. <laughs> 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 I'm okay. Come on. The train station is this way. Based on that small clip that we have there, um, what communication skills or nonverbal communication skills did you guys notice? I saw like um, touching, like she touched him on his arm to let him know that everything was going to be okay. She yeah. gave him a hug, well, he hugged her, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and I think just listening. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that, Vanetta. There was a lot reflected in that character. The small blue character's name is Sadness to the other one. Okay, okay. Showed. The other one had her own agenda. Yeah, yeah, the other one certainly had her own agenda. She wanted to jump to, um... But the only thing he was waiting, I guess, was uh, his heart, and so he cries, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, the empathy that the other one shows, that was a huge part. Yeah, that's a great point, Maritza. Um, it kind of shows the difference between um, empathy and sympathy, you know. The one yellow character who's supposed to be Joy is showing that I, I feel bad for you and I, I, I feel for you, but I'm not feeling with you. I still want to get done what I want to get done, while as the blue character labeled Sadness is sitting with it, is attuned and, you know, aware of how it feels to be in that position. And caring. It, yeah, yeah, it's like emotion is the dance that is attachment theory, how we weave in our emotions and use our empathy to recognize how kids are feeling or how anyone is feeling is kind of how we build stronger attachment with people because we see that um, they value us and we appreciate that, so. Thank you. Anyone else um, before we move on? I think it's also just a good demonstration of like one modality of trying to cheer somebody up doesn't always work every time because there can be some situations in what Joy did can be helpful and there can be some situations in what Sadness did might not be helpful. Um, so I think it's a very like good demonstration of there's never like one way to like approach those types of situations and kind of helps build that communication of like okay do you need just somebody to vent to or are you looking for feedback for things um and so i think that was a very especially like as a children's movie i think that's a good uh demonstration of like you can't always approach every situation the same yeah, yeah, that's a great point, Whitney. Um, I really like that movie. Um, did you guys know there's actually a second one coming out soon? Ooh. I'm actually, <laughs> actually kind of excited because I, I really like that movie. Um, I wanted but, to go. Yeah, yeah, I should go. Um, but to your point, Whitney, yeah, I mean, in asking children openly, like, would you like space? Or would you like someone to kind of step in and sit with you? You know, it, it allows a child to feel like they're allowed to make their own decision. It's that autonomy that we allow children to build. Even if we see them distressed, you know, they're allowed to have the right to sit with them, their own feelings themselves, rather than 
overstep the boundary and kind of turn into this overprotective parent, which could, you know, create these different outcomes for kids down the line, this anxiety that could kind of grow. But um, thank you everyone for your participation in that. I really like that clip. But um, yeah, this is uh, my last slide and it is something that I stand by and really, really enjoy. Um, I read this acronym that kind of helps sew together the verbal and nonverbal communication skills into this acronym called HEART. And what HEART is, is at its base, um, prioritizing the here and now with your kids. It shows that you're undistracted and you're present. Your presence um, is felt and that you put away your phone, your smartwatch, whatever it is, and you are mindful of your time with them. You are aware. And um, the E stands for express delight. You know, similar to that affirmations, it communicates with your kid things that you enjoy about them, um, what they've accomplished, and what you appreciate about them as a person kind of builds that self-esteem. And it kind of also lets them know um, through spoken word, you know, how they enrich your life and how special they are. Um, the next one is A, which is attunement. And so like attuning with your child can mean a lot of things. It could mean um, empathizing with their various um, emotional states, similar to how we saw sadness sit with the other character. It could also mean um, saying something as simple as um, your response makes sense if you see your kid in distress. Affirming and attuning that what is going on with them is normal. Normalizing a emotional response to something that they're feeling. Um, next is routines and rituals. And it kind of establishes the routine of connection, you know, something that you can look forward to that anchors us in reassurance that we have a time and place during the week, during the month, during the day that is super important to us. Because establishing those kind of activities, whether it's, you know, you watch a TV show together, you read a book together, or, you know, you go for a walk together, can be something that children can learn to um, emotionally regulate with because they have that thing to look forward to with someone that they care about. And lastly, we have turning towards conflict. You know, conflict is something that is um, inevitable with most relationships. So how do we make conflict more navigatable? Um, something that I think is being able to make a repair after a conflict. You know, if you have this regrettable experience with someone that you love, don't be afraid to take time. Maybe jump in and say, you know, I, I'm sorry I said that. You know, when emotions swell, it's important to kind of model behavior that you would want to see in your kids. So if there's a moment where, you know, the stress of your day or the lack of time that you have influences your um, behavior. Um, preparing that conflict can be incredibly helpful and model some pretty healthy um, skills for your kids to manage in the future. Um, so with that being said, I will go on to my conclusion, which is that attachment helps us form an understanding of how we came to be. We understand that this psychological growth has an impact not only now when our children are young, but has an impact on their future as well. And we can kind of see hopefully through our illustration of how the brain works and manages stress. It can also influence our connections with kids and their connections with themselves, their mental health, their emotions, and their relationships with other people. So it's my hope that by showing different ways that we can communicate, whether verbal or nonverbal, we can kind of build and solidify relationships with not only our kids, but with ourselves and other people. And with that being said, um, 
Thank you so much, Ben, for that amazing presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, if you would like to give feedback on this presentation, um, I put a link in the chat. Um, it helps improve uh, our quality of presentations going forward. Um, all submissions are anonymous. Um, so please, uh, to help improve the quality of presentations in the future, uh, please let us know uh, if anything can do better, things that you enjoyed about the presentation. Uh, we'd greatly appreciate it. If you enjoyed this presentation today and you want to keep up more with what MJ4S Union Hub is doing within the community, uh, you can follow us on social media at NJ, the number four S Union. Um, and you can see any upcoming events or activities that we have in the community. Um, if you would like a presentation like this um, for your community, uh, you can email us at nj, the number four S, union at preventionlinks.org. Um, and so thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we greatly appreciate you joining us uh, for this very informative session. Um, and please stay tuned uh, for more uh, webinars and activities and presentations from NJ4S. Um, and we also have a YouTube channel where all of our webinars um, are going to be uploaded um, for public access. Um, so if you ever miss a live uh, webinar presentation, uh, feel free to check out our YouTube page. Uh, we are in the process of updating that with our old webinar recordings. Alright, everyone, thank you so much and have a great day.